Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm here with a very exciting video. It's one that I've been looking forward to doing for like a couple of months since I did my last one. It's not quite three months because my last one I didn't think about doing until way after the end of the quarter. But anyway, I'm rambling already. This is, of course, my QT favourites. So these are my ten favourite books that I read between the months of April, May and June. I don't know how many books this is out of, actually. Let me check. Alright, so having totaled it up, I believe this is correct. I might be wrong. I'll correct this on the screen if not. But I think this is out of 82 books that I read. And this is my top 10. I'm going to show you these. So this is my top 10. And I'm going to talk you through it. Let me take a screenshot though. Okay, so we're going to count backwards from book number 10. So in at number 10, we have Dave Trott. 1 plus 1 equals 3, a masterclass in creative thinking. And when I talked about this, I basically kind of explained it as a book that teaches you to think outside the box, even though I hate that phrase. So I read an example from it, and I guess I'm going to read a different one at random, just to give you a feel for both his writing style and for the kind of things he writes about. I'm just going to read this one, because otherwise I'm going to spend all day trying to find the perfect one. But this is kind of long, but I think it gives you a good example of what this book is about and then after that I'll just move on to the next one so bangs for your book in 1940 the British army had escaped from Dunkirk but they left all their weapons on the beaches an army can't fight without weapons they needed guns in a hurry here was one instance in which getting the brief right was crucial if the brief had been for well-designed well-made weapons it would have taken years to manufacture Britain didn't have the time a brief for high quality durable weapons would have cost a fortune Britain didn't have the money. So the brief was very clear. Fast and cheap. We need guns, we need lots of them, and we need them now. And so the design wasn't deliberated over by a group of experts who considered various options that were researched exhaustively. One man sat at his kitchen table and designed the gun. He designed it from parts that were easily available. He designed it from material that was cheap. He designed it so that it could be made by anyone. It was called the Sten Gun. It could fire the ordinary 9mm rounds the average pistol used. It was made from stamped metal, which could be punched out on a press or shaped with a hammer. It was made from the exhaust pipe used on most cars, from nuts and bolts you could buy in the local ironmonger's shop. The mainspring was made by a bedspring manufacturer. It had just 47 parts and could be built in a shed. It cost just over £2, which was an average week's wages. It was so cheap and easy to make that the main manufacturer was the Triang Toy Company. They switched overnight from making tin toys to making the gun. By the end of the war, four million Sten guns had been made. They were sold everywhere in the world. That's what real creativity is. Form follows function. It's not just making something attractive that wins awards. It's solving a problem in an unexpected and innovative way. So yeah, I just think this is a great book for just getting new ideas and for sort of thinking in different ways that you might not have thought about before. Okay, in at number nine we have Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier and I actually posted a full review of this which I'll link to below. My enjoyment of this was kind of hampered both by the cover and the introductory essay, both of which contained spoilers for me. But uh, I kind of knew the plot anyway, I just had more spoilers. So by the time I went into reading this book, I basically knew the entire thing from start to finish. Fortunately, De Maurier's writing was just beautiful, and so it was something that I could enjoy, you know, I enjoyed the journey. I didn't have to enjoy, you know, I didn't need to worry about knowing the destination to enjoy the journey. So yeah, Daphne De Maurier, Rebecca at number 9, and I'm going to read some more of her work soon. Okay, at number 8 we have Create Dangerously by Albert Camus, and this is Penguin Mini Modern number 17. This is the first two Penguin Mini Moderns in this video, and the only two Penguin Mini Moderns to make it into the top 10 or whatever. So, because uh, I only started reading them this quarter. So this is basically Camus' thoughts on the responsibility that artists and creators have basically to almost to challenge the status quo. His point here is that if you're not coming under any criticism, you're not doing it right, you know. So um, let that be a thing for you if you get dislikes on BookTube, you know. If someone's disliking your videos, it's because you're creating dangerously. The main essay in this is Create Dangerously, but there are two other essays in this as well. It's Create Dangerously, though, that really makes this stand out for me. I, I think anybody who wants to do anything in any form of creativity, whether that's making YouTube videos, whether it's writing, whether it's art, you know, it doesn't matter whether you want to be a singer, you need to read this essay, I think. If nothing else, if you don't read anything else by Camus, 
read Create Dangerously. And the entire text of this essay is available online anyway, so you don't even need to buy this book, you can just Google it and read it. At number seven we have Letter from Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King Jr. And this is number one in the Penguin Mini Modern series, and I can totally see why they started the series with this. It's just a super important essay on, not just on race, but on morality itself, and the way that we have a responsibility to stand up for what we believe in, even if that leads to incarceration or, you know, assassination, unfortunately. So one of these is an essay, and one of them is kind of, it was a sermon, basically. But um, don't let that put you off if you're not religious, because I'm not religious at all. And... Uh, yeah, it's just fantastic, like stunningly well written, super relevant today, even though it was the letter from Birmingham Jail was originally written about a very specific thing. I think this is just required reading. Everybody should read this at some point. Okay, at number six, we have Agatha Christie, an autobiography. And this is a bit of a tricky one for me because this isn't necessarily a book that everyone will enjoy, but it is one of my favourites of the quarter, so it, it had to be included here and in its rightful place, you know. I've also posted a full review of this that stretched to 45 minutes, which I'll link to below. Basically, if you are at all interested in Agatha Christie, you need to read this book. At the same time, it's interesting just to see the time she grew up in and the shifting attitudes towards sort of sexuality and gender and society. She lived from about 1890 to 1970 odd. Those aren't the exact dates, but uh, here, here it is on the back actually, 1890 to 1976. And obviously she is the queen of crime. I believe she's the h highest selling novelist of all time. So, um, yeah, I mean, she's just a really super influential writer, and it's actually really sad because she didn't think of herself as a writer. She thought of herself as a housewife first and a writer second, which is, you know, a real shame. If you're an Agatha Christie fan, you just have to read it, and even if not, you're probably going to find something from it as well. Although, I will say, it is a bit of a beast. I mean, it's 560 pages long in tiny, tiny print. But it is, again, it's great, so it's worth it. In at number five, we have The Talisman by Stephen King and Peter Straub. And I read this in three days when I went to Berlin on holiday. I, I, I actually said it in, in uh, probably in my wrap up, and I did film a review and write a review. The filmed review, I don't think, is ever coming out, but <laughs> in my written review, basically, a lot of people told me this is one of King's best. And I disagree. For me, it didn't make it into King's top 10, but it does make it into his top 20, which is enough to make it in my top five of the quarter, really. That's why it's here. But um, I don't know. I didn't get any sense of Peter Straub and his writing style. It just felt like a King book to me. I like the way that it switches between our reality and the territories as well. Yeah, it was good. It wasn't great, but it was good, and it's easily enough to make it into my list. I actually will admit right now that I struggled with this list a bit, because I haven't had many, like, real all-time five-star books, you know. It's, um, I don't know, it's not been the best three months for reading, so, yeah, I struggled a bit. This, actually, I gave four out of five in my review, and it's, like, number five in my top books of the quarter, so make of that as you will. There is a sequel to this called Black House as well, which I haven't read yet, but I will be reading. I've heard that it's not as good, so I don't know. But I'll get to it eventually and let you guys know what I think. In at number four, we have Haruki Murakami, what I talk about when I talk about running. And this is like a non-fiction memoir. It's kind of about running, but it's also about Murakami's approach to life in general and also to his writing. It's the kind of book that you're going to enjoy if you're either a writer a Murakami fan, or someone who likes running. It's got stuff for all three of you, you know? And it's not a super long book, but it's just beautifully written, and it came at the right time for me, because basically Murakami was kind of my age now, when he decided to quit his job, he ran a, he ran a bar, and he, he quit his job and decided to start writing full time. And because he was spending a lot of time sitting behind a desk, as opposed to kind of doing manual labour and that sort of thing, he, uh, he realised he was putting on weight and he was getting unhealthy, so he decided to quit smoking, he decided to start exercising, and this really helped to get him into shape, and he's continued to do long distance running ever since. He, he runs a marathon each year, and he's kind of in his 60s now, well into his 60s, I believe. But uh, again, I quit smoking, I've changed my diet recently, I've also been doing a bit more exercise as well, so uh, it, was, it was good to see, you know, that he was doing at a similar point in his life and all worked out well for him, I suppose. So yeah, it was good. At number three, we have Our Doris by Charles Heathcote. And uh, this is an indie book. It's actually my best indie book of the year so far. It's also by a fellow booktuber, so I 
encourage you to check out his channel and his books, really. He writes in like a kind of a comedic style. It's a very Northern England sense of humour, but that's fine. I mean, I was raised in the Midlands, so he's a bit farther north of me, but we have a lot of the similar kind of terminology and stuff like, uh, you know, referring to people as duck and pet and, you know, Doris is like a, I suppose, middle class elderly woman and she's married to a guy called Harold, R. Harold, and uh, she, it's basically she wants to rise through the social ranks, you know, and so she enters their house into uh, like a, a garden safari where people go from one garden to another and she's just determined to win this thing. It's very reminiscent of Keeping Up Appearances, if you've ever watched that, with Hyacinth Bouquet. And um, it's, it's just very funny. Yeah, it's just funny, very British, very quirky, very unique, and very well written. And like formatted and edited and everything indie book. It's just a great book. I would definitely recommend you check it out. Okay, then at number two, we have The Martian by Andy Weir, and this was a buddy read, as a few of these have been, actually. I know that I read this with Brian's bookshelves, and he ranked this as his favourite book of the year, at least so far. Uh, it's my second favourite of the quarter, so that's pretty good. This was actually originally self-published as well, before being picked up by Random House. It's obviously also a movie. I'd actually seen the movie first, and the book and the movie are, like, very similar. The movie is a very, kind of, pretty much like a a word for word adaptation of it or whatever there aren't really any changes which means that nothing really surprised me here but that was fine because again the writing and the plot itself and the humor kind of just grabbed me mark one he was a great character and uh weird did a great job with this one but i've heard that like uh his next one artemis wasn't so good and to be honest i have no burning desire to read any more of andy weir's stuff but at the same time yeah it was a good book and it has like cross genre appeal as well so you don't even need necessarily need to be a sci-fi fan to enjoy it so so yeah and finally we have as you wish by Carrie Elwes and this is written with Joe Layden who's like helped to ghostwrite a number of sort of New York Times bestsellers I actually did a full review of this one as well, which I will link to below. This is basically Elwes's kind of memoirs of the time he spent filming The Princess Bride, which is one of my favourite movies. It's also a book by William uh, Goldman, but I, I, I mean, I read it after seeing the movie a hundred plus times. So for me, the the movie is always my favourite. Which is kind of why I enjoyed this so much because it was just great to hear all the tales of what the staff got up to. The staff. The actors and that kind of thing. Actually, the staff as well, because you get things like the catering staff and the sound and light team and all this stuff. There are just so many anecdotes about what happened during the shooting of the film and with so many talented people and so many funny people as well involved in the shoot. There's just, just story after story that just warmed my heart, you know. I've also heard that the audiobook of this is great, so I'm probably going to reread it via audio at some point. You're not, you're not necessarily going to enjoy it as much as I did, unless you're a big fan of the movies. But because I'm such a big fan of the movies, this was just, it was just perfect. I didn't know how much I needed this book until I read it. And um, yeah, it was just great. I, I already want to reread this, to be honest. So yeah, those are my 10 favourites of Q2. Be sure to let me know in the comments which have been your favourites of the last three months. Let me know if you've read any of these as well, because I'd love to chat about them. Even if you hated them, we can have a good debate going. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.